evening. We have an, an awful lot of you who are already here, and I, I really appreciate that. I, uh, I want to get going almost right away. Uh, I'll give you a little itinerary of, of what I have planned for this stream. Um, I, I want to begin by just talking briefly. I, I, something I should probably start off with is, at no point during this stream are we going to show graphic images or video of the actual incident, the, the euthanizations that happened, uh, anything like that. You've, there are plenty of places where you can see that. I, I find that uh, very, very difficult to watch, and you know, there's a place for that. It's not going to be during this stream. What, what we are going to be doing, we are going to be discussing it, though. I'm, I'm not going to discuss it in detail more graphic than is necessary to be factually accurate as to what happened, but uh, I am going to discuss specifically what happened on April 6th. That will be the first thing, thing that we'll do. Um, then I'll talk to you about what I've been doing since then to, to prepare for this moment. Uh, I'll, I'll then give you the, the full statement, or actually not the full statement, but uh, the full story of what occurred and what led up to it according to my current understanding, which is, you know, it, it's, while I won't argue that it's perfectly complete, it's, it's more extensive than I've, I've been able to encounter in any one place. Um, I'll then give you my thoughts about what happened and the events that led up to it. Um, and and I'll, I'll share some questions that I still have that remain unanswered. Uh, the list has actually become relatively short. Uh, this morning, I had a pretty long list, but uh, a lot of important things happened today that answered the vast majority of my questions, but I, I still have a few that are extremely important to answer. I, I'm gonna talk about a few of the misconceptions that I've seen passed around about this incident and, and the things that have happened before and since then uh, that I, I think we need to correct. I, I'm going to give you my thoughts about what we should do now in response to this incident moving forward as, as a reptile community. Um, all along the way, I'm going to be taking questions from you guys and answering them as best as I can. Sometimes if I'm really in the middle of uh, talking through the facts of a certain situation, I'll probably stop for that. At some point, there's a pretty good chance Athena will pee all over me. She once destroyed my computer, so yeah, I might need to pause for a second to, to deal with that. <laughs> so that, that could be a, a little uh, lighthearted moment. And, and uh, you know, after, after we take questions for a while, I do have a few pieces of good news. For the most part, I want to discuss really just things related to uh, what has been deemed the Holy Thursday Massacre during this stream, but I do have some, some unrelated, very good news that I'd like to share with you guys. Um, I also have a, a piece of really terrible news, uh, news that you may already be aware of, but I, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that as well because I haven't had an opportunity. So anyway, that's, that's sort of our itinerary. Of course, you know, I, in that itinerary, I don't have built in to talk to you about all of the things that I've learned. And so, you know, if you guys have specific questions, I, I think I'm going to be covering a lot of the, what I view as the most important things, but I've learned a lot in addition to that. And so please uh, send questions all on the way. This is, this is a really, really important moment for the reptile hobby because, uh, uh, you know, as you've probably noticed, the hobby has in many ways kind of been under assault in recent years. Um, and, and generally speaking, we don't get positive PR uh, as, as a community. And, and this, is, this is an unusual time. And as, as difficult as it is, it's also really important that we do the right things. So what happened? Make sure I got, I got my list of notes so I get my, my dates correct. But, but what happened on April 6th of this year, 2023? Um, you know, m many of you are probably quite aware of this, but a, a group of over 30, about uh, roughly three dozen uh, reticulated and Burmese pythons were euthanized by FWC 
officers down in Florida, these, these pythons were uh, on their prohibited species list in the state of Florida due to concerns about invasive species. And, and they were euthanized um, in a relatively, I mean, in an extremely brutal manner. Um, and, and video was recorded by the owner of the pythons, Chris Coffey, in the, uh, that, that has been released to us since then. In addition to the roughly three dozen illegal snakes that were euthanized, uh, one additional snake, a, a boa, I imagine to be boa imperator, it's often reported as boa constrictor, but a uh, boa imperator that, that belonged to Bill McAdam, who also was one of the, the tenants of the facility where the, the now illegal snakes were being housed. His snake was also euthanized, uh, even though it had been pointed out to the officers on multiple occasions, uh, multiple times, that that snake was a legal snake, was not part of the, the three dozen that were to be euthanized. Um, and that particular boa was, boas are live bearers, and uh, she had roughly, I think, 32 uh, almost full-term baby boas inside of her, uh, which may have had a value in the you know, over over a thousand piece for many of them. So, you know, definitely a, a horrible mistake at the very least, which in addition to being awful in terms of the loss of life, also has significant financial consequences. That is what happened on April and um, I will tell you, when I first saw headlines for this, you know, I, in just the headlines, I was obviously not getting a very big picture. But I was seeing that 36 eagle snakes, or 30, roughly three dozen eagle snakes, were euthanized by FWC officers, and one boa was accidentally euthanized as well. And, you know, while I, I view that as being a horrible, horrible tragedy, as, you know, and, and that really none of the snakes deserve anything like this. At first, it sort of seemed like this is something that can happen if you're choosing to house uh, a bunch of illegal snakes. As I, as I started to dig into this a little bit more, you know, I quickly discovered that there's a lot more backstory to what and how those snakes became ill. That is, in some ways, um, maybe more upsetting than even what occurred on April 6th. And, and, you know, the deeper I dug, the more questions I had. And so I have been trying to access all of the information I can. I started off speaking with a number of reptile keepers in Florida. Did you have a question, Jason? Mm, there's some lag issue, it's evidently, with the quality. Okay. Which I don't know if there's much we can. Yeah, I apologize. Let me let me double check one thing if there's a, a lag issue. Yeah, uh, this is unfortunately probably just the best we can do. Um, so I, I'm gonna I'm gonna move forward a little bit. I, I apologize for the lag. Any, I'll, I'll try to go slowly. Don't hesitate to ask me to repeat anything. Okay, saying it's better now, slightly at least. Lagging. Okay. So what I've been doing, I, I began by speaking with keepers that I know in Florida that deal with FWC on a regular basis, as well as um, you know other people who are connected with organizations such as U.S. Arc. And I, I was getting a very, very different set of stories from the people kind of depending on what their relationship would be like with FWC on a normal day, not even with, with all of this happening. And so, you know, I, I sort of recognized, I wanted to get to the bottom of what's the truth and what's not the truth. Um, I've, I, I have waded through the the footage that, that Chris Coffey shared, especially what 
was shared through uh, US Arc Florida's YouTube page. That footage was, honestly, if I wasn't doing this, I probably wouldn't have made myself sit through it. It is, it's, it's really difficult to watch, particularly given that I, I now keep reticulated pythons. This is, this is one of my, my super dwarf reticulated pythons that I got from Garrett Hardell at Reach Out Reptiles. And, you know, over these years that I've been keeping them, I've gained a real understanding for how intelligent and, and special these snakes are. And so it's been particularly, it, it, makes, it makes it harder to watch something like that. You know, especially the moments when he's talking about the fact that they're tap trained, just like my snakes are, and that, you know, she's a sweetheart, all you need to do is tap her, and then she'll trust you. And then they get, them, get her out and, and brutally euthanize her. Um, I, I had to watch it over many days because it's just, it's, it's very, very emotionally tolling to sit through it. Uh, I've also watched a great deal of other media uh, videos from uh, Camp Kennan. Uh, Kennan has an excellent video that is full of quite a lot of the, vid of the video and photographic uh, images of the brutality, so be aware of that. I've watched uh, quite a bit of what Nerd has released, including the body cam footage from an early in, earlier incident that we'll discuss later. Um, that, that February body cam footage was really interesting as it answered a few of my questions. I've, I've spoken with uh, Phil Goss directly for quite a lot of time. He was really good, answered so many of my questions. For those of you who do not know who, who Phil is, uh, Phil is the president of US ARC, which is a really, really important advocacy group for reptile keepers here in the United States and one well, was well worth supporting. And so Phil was able to answer a lot of my questions. I've also spoken with FWC. And, and I will tell you, it took me a while to get through, you know, all the menus and, and automated things and, and speaking to people who couldn't help me that much. But I eventually found people there who were extremely helpful. Um, and so I've, I've really had, it, it was difficult. Um, I, I will say for uh, pretty much the first time ever, I was introducing myself as Dr. Clint Laidlaw. Uh, I, I feel really weird about that generally, but I, I you know, I was, I just, I definitely, I, I, I recognize that they're probably getting a lot of phone calls from people who are just wanting to yell at them right now. And, and maybe there's a place for that, but I, I, I needed something to set myself apart. And once I was in the door with them, uh, they were very, very accommodating. And in, including today, I was able to get my hands on the full incident report, which is you know, well over 100 pages long, though most of that is uh, photographs. The, the actual incident report text is only about 10 pages long. And that also answered a number of questions, though not all that I had. Um, I, I've read the prepared statements from FWC. They just have a preliminary statement out right now. I may read that in its entirety during this stream. Um, and then, uh, so that, that really is, is the bulk of, of my research. So, so maybe, maybe I should pause for a second. It seems like there's a lot of questions and things being said, and I, I, I want to make sure I don't move on too fast, but I, I do want to get to the full story here in a second, or, or do you think we're good? Uh, you're good. There's just a lot, a lot of people are obviously frustrated with the situation. Mm -hmm. Uh, and maybe it'd be great to remind them to be, uh, civil and polite in their conversations. Uh, yeah, and, and I'll get to that, I'll get to that. You know, I completely understand your anger and frustration. And I'm not even gonna tell you that it doesn't have a place here. Um, just make sure that it is bridled in a way that is for good, because we could also do a tremendous amount of damage to the reptile hobby in general by not controlling our passion about this, this particular incident. Um, okay, so let me, let, me get, let me get to the full story. Um, and this is, this is actually gonna, this goes back to about 2009. So I'm gonna start this story uh, roughly 14 years ago. The, Prior to 2009, there were already regulations in place because Florida, believe it or not, is a place where lots of exotic animals could do okay. 
in some cases could thrive. Um, you know, here, here in Utah, for example, a lot of exotic animals could get loose. You could, you could release, say, say uh, 100 million green iguanas this year. And if this would be the summer of green iguanas. Come winter, we would be back to a population of zero green iguana. But in Florida, everything could live. And so in order to, to attempt to protect the, the, the native ecosystem in Florida, there's been regulation for a long time. In 2009, they instituted something called a conditional species permit, which applied to animals like Burmese pythons and reticulated pythons. This conditional species permit is not something that is required here in Utah because my reticulated pythons wouldn't be able to become an invasive threat. But it is something that the people in Florida needed to, needed to um, follow. And in order to get a conditional species permit, you needed to have an escape-proof facility, I think double-doored, and there's a, a whole lot of, of really intense specifications to prevent accidental escapes. Uh, you need to have regular and unscheduled inspections from officers to verify that, that you know, everything's being kept properly according to their regulations and that nothing, nothing has escaped or been released. Every animal that you had needed to be microchipped, at least once it got to a certain size, which is gonna be an important detail later. Uh, you can't do it on a really, really small individual. Every, every individual needed to be registered with the state of Florida, uh, and there needed to be an inventory provided continuously. If you had a conditional species permit, you could A, keep these species, such as Burmese pythons and reticulated pythons. You could breed reticulated pythons and Burmese pythons assuming only that you could sell only to other people with conditional species permits in the state of Florida or out of the state of Florida. So you couldn't sell to people in Florida without a conditional species permit. And uh, to be perfectly honest, I think in a state like Florida, with animals that you are genuinely concerned about having become, A, become invasive, and B, being a real problem if they were invasive, that's, that's not a wholly unreasonable policy. And um, that was working for a long time. And I will tell you that Chris Coffey, the, the individual in question, had those permits. He was a, a conditional species permit holder, and he had the, the conditional species permit at the time when he obtained all of the snakes that he had, including those that were euthanized uh, here earlier this month. So, so that's a, a very, very important detail. In let, let me see if I can get you the exact date. Um, well, I, I'll, I'll tell you earlier, earlier, well, in 2021, the these animals were changed from being conditional species to being prohibited species. As prohibited species, you were no longer allowed to breed them at all. In fact, as a breeder or a private keeper, you were not even allowed to keep the animals that you had. The only way that you could continue to keep your animals that you had under your conditional species permit was to become an exhibitioner. So, so you had to have some way of sharing them with the public. Um, in, in some cases, this means that you have open walk-in hours so that people can come and, and, and view your animals, um, which running a facility like that, I know that there's a lot of hoops to jump through. Alternatively, I, I know a few people who are, are in Florida and have large followings on YouTube and that allowed them to obtain the, the permit to be grandfathered in essentially and be allowed to keep the animals that they have. But as Kenan laid out, once those animals die, uh, they can't get more. So they're, they're allowed to keep the ones they have and, and that's it. Being a breeder doesn't cut it. Now, they, they, once this change was made, people who were conditional species permits had 90 days to um, liquidate all of their, their now prohibited animals. What this means is they either needed to find homes for them out of the state of Florida, or they needed to have them euthanized. Those were all of the options that they had 
uh, and they had they had 90 days, uh, and so that ended on July 28th, 2021. That is when the end of the 90 days was, and at that point, any animal still in the collection of an individual who wasn't an exhibitioner with the the, the new grandfathered permitting, which is not very many of the people that, that had them could qualify for that. Um, if they didn't have them, they would be in violation of the law in the state of Florida. Um, this included Chris Coffey. Now, Chris Coffey, uh, at the point when, when these conditional species were made prohibited, he had roughly 140 reticulated pythons and Burmese pythons. Um, and I, I guess I'll get to how I feel about this. But during those 90 days, he was able to rehome over 100 of them. Um, but as, as time was running out, he began inquiring about an extension on the amount of time that he had. He, according to Chris Coffey, he just kind of was, was being given the runaround. He had, an, he had appointments with FWC officers who wouldn't show up. And when they finally did show up, it wasn't until February of 2022, at which point uh, they told him that charges were, were being filed against him and they were doing what is called a constructive seizure, which means that the, the state was, uh, for all intents and purposes, taking ownership of his pythons. Uh, he had to, to sign away his ownership to the state of those pythons, but the pythons were being left in his care uh, pending a, a future date. And, and so he, he then w was left to care for those those snakes uh, at his own expense, at the expense of his own time. It was not legal for him to sell them, for him to euthanize them, for him to move them in any way. They were just to remain in the facility, being under his care until further notice. And the, the, they remained there for another 14 months. So for, for 14 months, Chris Coffey maintained and cared for those roughly three dozen remaining Burmese pythons and reticulated pythons. At which point on April 6th, uh, FWC officers arrived. They say in, in the incident report and in their, their public statements that Chris Coffey uh, asked them to euthanize the snakes. I, I, I should back up just a little bit. They came to his facility one day following finding a reticulated python sort of in the area. It appears to be roughly 15 miles away through a pretty highly populated area. So, you know, not that close. It would be very difficult for a snake to move 15 miles across all these busy roads and things. But um, the, 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 they were responding to that to, to verify that it wasn't one of his snakes. And they went, uh, they report with no intention of euthanizing the snakes on that day. However, when, when, uh, while they were there at some point, and, and I, this is one of the questions that I, I still have as to what that point was, but apparently Chris Coffey asked them to euthanize the snakes, and they did um, using a, a captive bolt device, which is a device designed for the euthanization of animals, um, but not followed by a secondary procedure known as pithing, which I will explain uh, here in a little bit. Um, that will actually be the most graphic moment of, of this whole discussion as far as I know. Um, and, and, and the animals were, were taken, as we discussed before, one animal that did not belong to Chris Coffey, but belonged to Bill McAdam, which was a, a legal boa, was al also euthanized. Um, photographs were taken by the officers at the time for maybe various reasons, maybe some reasons that, that uh, we haven't talked about before. And, and so that is the big picture going back to 2009 all the way until this event. Um, I will tell you that US Arc Florida has a lawsuit currently in progress in the state of Florida regarding the way that this law change was administered and a lot of the consequences of it, uh, potential issues with the uh, constitutionality and, and uh, 
overreach of the government in this case, but that is still pending. Okay, um, let's see where that where that puts us. I'm gonna I'm gonna put her back for a moment, so I can I can focus more completely on on what I have to say. Uh, but I know we have a few questions, so yeah, we can we can cover some of the uh, super chats. Yeah, I don't know if it's uh, appropriate to give your char characteristic <laughs> super chat noise. This will be a, this will be a more subdued super chat. Yes. Uh, when we get any good news, I can do uh, enthusiastic super chat. Good. Uh, so uh, before we actually started the stream, uh, Radiant Kratos. Uh, said, is there a way to find humans, uh, sorry, find reptiles in immediate need of adoption like this? If I knew this was going to happen, I might have been able to take one of the snakes. I have also had this question. How, so, so the question is effectively, how can, how can we find out about animals like this? And I, I will tell you, so the state of Florida, for example, has at least theoretically, in an amnesty program in which the state will, no questions asked, take in illegal animals and rehome them. I know here in Utah, they at least at times do something very similar. Um, there are a lot of animals that are seized by the state and hopefully not euthanized, but are rehomed by the state. And, and so, you know, I, I need to dig a little bit more as to how how you access that, but that would be a place. I also think that there may be a great need for this. I mean, there are reptile rescues around, um, but you know, this might this might be a place for, where somebody with the right sort of, of expertise could establish a little business that does help link people from people who have animals surrendered, illegal animals, even just you know rehoming them and, and helps them connect with each other. I but uh, that's about all I can say about that at the moment. Uh, Jessica Cohen sent a super chat earlier. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, she Zane uh, sent a super chat saying, everyone be polite to Clint, please. <laughs> uh, T.O. Loser sent a super chat saying, be polite. You can go a long way. Uh, Anthony Simone. Anthony. Anthony sent a super chat saying, good to see your face again, my friend. Uh, I just wish it was under better circumstances. Sim simply want to say thank you for bringing this horrific incident to light. Uh, hope you and your family are all well. Well, thank you, Anthony. I, I, I haven't seen you for a little bit. I'm looking at your piano right now and, and uh, hope I get to see you again soon. Uh, Russ from Aquarimax Pets sent a super chat saying, thank you, Clint, for addressing this horrific issue in a well-informed and level-headed way. Eric, Thank you, Russ. Eric, Eric Killian sent a, uh, sent a fun uh, super sticker, I think what they're called. I forget what they're called. What does it look like? Uh, it is a cute little, I'm going to go with a fox saying thank you. Well, you're very welcome, Mr. Fox. Uh, Charlotte's mom sent a super chat saying thank you for this very important information, Clint. Thumbs up. Uh, Gloria sent a super chat saying, this is a serious discussion. Uh, oh, she's talking about the comments that uh, were getting a little rough a little bit. Uh, saying, if you have an ax to grind, just, just cannot stay on topic or cannot respond without being unprofessional and or unhelpful, please just shush. Thanks. I, I will tell you, I will tell you. Um, if you need to say something rude about this, I mean, you know, in the chat, go for it, right? Like, I, I actually don't have time to read everything, so if, if, you, wanna, if you want me to see the, how rude you can be, uh, do it as a super chat, uh, and I'll have a better chance of actually hearing from it. But this is, I mean, there, there are places worse than this. If you, got, if you have to unload, I, I, guess, I guess here's acceptable. I, it, won't, it won't hurt my feelings. I understand where you're coming from, and... and uh, you know, we just need to be careful outside of here how we conduct ourselves. But you can be rude to me all you want. Uh, there, yeah, okay. Uh, so a person that I can't say their name very well, Listro Games and Vlogs 47 
says, I hope the FWC apologizes. Uh, that, that is one thing I, that I think is very possible. You know, I, I think uh, they know they messed up. And the reality is, objectively, they messed up. The question is just how big and for how long and you know, how many times have they messed up. But, but there's no question that they made at least one egregious mistake. Uh, Giles Kangaroo sent a super chat saying, as a Catholic and as an exotics keeper, I am horrified by the killing of God's creatures on Holy Thursday. Uh, let's see, Rebecca Locklear sent a super chat saying, I have to deal with FWC soon with a tour. Um, how would you talk with them and see the opportunity to educate? That's a great question. Um, and and I'll, uh, hopefully I can get to that a little bit too when I get to talking about what we can do. But, um, I, and this is something I will be talking about. One of the things is I, I think we have an opportunity, especially because FWC knows they made a mistake and, and a bad one, and it's getting a lot of bad PR. We have an opportunity to approach them in a way that is about education and working together. Uh, here in Utah, We've had a great deal of success changing the laws in a way that is beneficial for reptile keepers, but also achieves the conservation objectives of the government here. And, and that's by working together and being an ally to them. And so I think just, just coming in there, I, you know, I definitely don't want this to be forgotten. And, and, and I don't think there's any wrong in reminding them, especially until they have done something to remedy this. As, as, much as is possible, but uh, yeah, offering offering help as a friend instead of an enemy is much much more likely to work. If you if you come at them in an adversarial way, you're likely just to be shut down. Uh, Dark Wings Inc. sent a super chat. Just to send a super chat. Well, thank you, Dark Wings. Dark Wings Inc. Uh, Anubis sent a super chat saying, thank you for all the research and effort you put into finding out all the details of this tragedy. Tragedy. I hope you will be okay. I imagine this took a mental toll on you. We love you. Thank you very much. I, I, I'm generally speaking a, a pretty emotionally stable person. And uh, this has been really taxing. I have paced myself well. So, you know, I, I, I've been okay to shut it off when it's more than I can handle. Uh, and, and, I, but I, and I really, I do appreciate the people that are concerned for, for my em, emotional health. Uh, it is something that I'm, I'm working to make sure that I maintain. Uh, this is an interesting one. Uh, fish said, uh, sent a super chat saying, never talk to the police and never let them around your loved ones. It's a little, little uh, rough. Yeah. Um, this, that, is, that is a big topic. Um, you know, the, the interaction with law enforcement. You know, I, I don't want to live in a place with no law enforcement, but as long as law enforcement exists, you know, there's going to be a lot of people with power and some of them will be good with it and some will not. Um, and, and there's going to be oppor you know, mistakes will be made and there will be opportunities for terrible tragedies to occur. And so exactly how we balance all of that and how, how we go about our, our relationship to law enforcement is a complicated one to say the least. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Moralia, Moralia yes. sent a super chat saying, it's unfortunate, but you are well qualified to handle this situation and explain it to us in an informed way. Well, thank you very much. I, I, I hope that this is making it a little bit more clear and I, I should get moving here in a moment. Um, if you have questions, especially about this incident, details that are still not making sense to you, please ask because I've been seeking the answers to these questions all this time and I've, I've talked to a lot of the right people. I, I think I, I do have answers at least to 
the big questions I could think of, and I'd be happy to read through them at some point, what, what are a lot of these questions, and make sure I share those answers with you, but I'd love to know what questions you have lingering. Um, really quickly, so I've shared the, the full story. What I think, I might, I might combine that with what I think and questions I still have. Okay, so the reality is, as I've already said, at least one egregious mistake was made, and that egregious mistake was the accidental killing of that boa. When I first saw headlines, I, I felt like that, that sort of collateral damage is the kind of thing that can happen if you, say, are a person that has 36 illegal animals and one legal one that looks really similar mixed in there. That, yeah, there's a possibility that the government is going to come and euthanize your animals and there's a possibility that your one legal one is going to get tied up in it too. And, and so as much as that's a mistake, I felt like it, you know, that's, that's a mistake that falls on the keeper. That was until I discovered the background, how he wound up having roughly three dozen uh, illegal animals. Legally, what Chris Coffey needed to have done was he needed to euthanize his remaining 36 animals before the 90 days were over. That, that was his only remaining legal option. However, I sympathize greatly with him. I'm impressed and amazed that he was able to rehome over 100 animals in 90 days. Uh, you know, it, it is one thing to rehome, say, 100 baby ball pythons, which you can send overnight through the mail at about 60 to $75 a box. And, um, you know, finding that many homes is not that hard. Finding homes for over 100 giant snakes, which many of them are breeders more than they are pets, so I don't know on what level they were socialized. So you've got, you've got over 100 giant and potentially not very friendly snakes, and you, you need to get them out of the state of Florida, which generally means, you know, even if you find a home, 60 to $75 to ship a tiny little baby ball python. I have no idea what it is like trying to overnight a 150 pound, 20 foot python. I have zero idea, but I know it's very expensive and very difficult to do. And he got over a hundred of them rehomed, which is incredible. It's incredible. And it seems to me that he was not being unreasonable in saying, hey, I've always complied. I had everything microchipped. I had everything registered. I have always, always complied. In the, in the uh, report that I was able to get my hands on today, the, the official uh, investigation report, they said that a few of his animals weren't what is called pit tagged. They weren't microchipped. And, and the reason for that was at the time when he had his conditional species permit, they were still too young to be pit tagged. They have to wait until they get a little bit bigger. And so that's why a few of them weren't pit tagged. But, but he, was, he was complying. And, and, and by law, they weren't required to be pit tagged until they got to the appropriate site. So he would complied with all of the laws. As soon as they, they said he had to move it, keep in mind, this is a big part of his livelihood. Right? He has who knows how much time and money invested in those snakes. You know, he is making a, a living, at least a big part of his living, as a snake breeder. And he has 90 days and that he is being shut down, so his job is gone, and he has to now spend the next 90 days rehoming over 100 animals. He gets over 100 of them out. He's left with, with roughly three dozen. That's amazing, and in my, in my opinion, a very strong sign of his good faith to eliminate everything. I think his asking for an extension was perfectly reasonable, and... I have not received an answer to the question exactly as to why he wasn't given an extension. To my knowledge, they didn't give extensions to anyone, and so it was a hard deadline. 
And so by law, probably his only legal option was to uh, euthanize the remaining snakes. But it is my understanding that he was at least under the hope that he was potentially going to be grandfathered in with those remaining snakes, or at least would be given an extension. But he did stop selling them out of state at the end of the 90 days, as was required by law. And, and he, uh, at least according to Chris Coffey, didn't hear back until they came there to euthanize it. Well, until they came there to seize his snakes and uh, press charges against him. Now, I, I will say uh, one, one thing, uh, this is a question that I had, is what, what became of those charges? And it sounds, uh, my, my understanding currently is that he settled outside of court with, with regard to that. Uh, he had, um, he's, he's still uh, serving probation for that, he additionally had community service time that he bought out financially for $250. And so that, that I, I heard some places that he was, that those charges were dismissed, other places that he was uh, serving probation. It seems that uh, what happened was that he settled out of court. So he, so he wasn't exonerated, but uh, he is dealing with, with those consequences of the charges that were pressed against him, which is, you know, uh, uh, the result of the fact that he still had the three dozen snakes, which the government knew about because he told them. He told them he had them. Um, which is, you know, it's a, it's a, it's horrible. That's a, that's a, that's a, in my opinion, a really terrible way to roll out laws. You know, and I, I think, I think uh, something like this, you know, if a person has, if a person has two snakes and they're given 90 days to rehome them, that's still hard, but it's doable. But they needed to, to and this is, this is where having people who are reptile keepers, for example, be part of creating the laws could be so beneficial. Because even if they did this change to make it prohibited, you could weigh in and say, you know, it's going to be really hard if you have, say, 140 of these to, re to move them all in 90 days. Maybe we need a, 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 a rollout more like, 90 days or 14 days per animal, which would have given him a couple, uh, you know, a few years to rehome it. You know, something that gives more time to people who have a much, much, you know, many orders of magnitude larger job to do. Um, let's see. As far as the euthanization itself, I have a certain level of understanding. You know, I, by, by training, I, I am an ecologist and, and evolutionary biologist. And I have a real respect for, for wild places. I think, I think we all do. It, you know, it's something that's been really great for me to talk to FWC about is the fact that their real core mission is a mission that is important to us as reptile keepers as well very much. And, and so fundamentally, we're in agreement. It's just been a matter of the way that, that things are, are actually done in the real world. When it comes to the mechanism, well, when it comes to the euthanization, so my biggest remaining question is this one, and I have asked it to Phil Goss from, from US ARC. I've asked it to FWC. Um, I have been told that there's an answer not by either of them, but by somebody connected to, with one of the officers involved, that the body camera footage might answer this question, but the body camera footage is not yet available. So that is something I'm waiting on, mostly for the answer to this one question. And my, my huge question is, if the officers went there on April 6th with no intention of euthanizing those snakes, why did it happen? I don't, I don't understand. You know, it, it would be one thing if they were sent from Tallahassee, they had orders, and I know for sure this isn't the case. I, I did inquire specifically about this, and, and they were able to tell me that this was not the case. This, these were not orders that came from Tallahassee that, hey, it's been 14 months, it's time to go euthanize those snakes. But for some reason, according to FWC and actually according to Chris Coffey. For some reason, Chris Coffey asked them to euthanize those snakes. Now, why? Why did he do that, A, and B, why did they listen? 
because as far as I know, and I inquired about this also, but I wasn't able to get a strong answer. As far as I know, those snakes are still not his property. He'd had to sign them over to FWC in, in, uh, it would be in, tw in February of 2022. So the, for the last 14 months, those were not his snakes. He was not allowed to sell them. He was not allowed to move them. He was not allowed to have them euthanized. And it was not his call, as far as I can tell, unless custody was returned to him, which is not on the public record to this point, as far as I know, at least as, as, as far as I've been able to ascertain. So why on earth would he ask them to, to euthanize those snakes? And B, why did they do it? Because they weren't his. It wasn't his call to make, as far as I know. That makes no sense to me. Assuming that, but assuming there's a good answer to that question, that, that you know, the, he... He genuinely, you know, I, I can I can imagine a scenario in which it's, uh, you know, he has learned that the end the end thing that is going to happen is eventually those snakes are going to be euthanized. And in the meantime, he is putting hundreds of dollars of food and hundreds of hours of care into those snakes. Uh, you know, every every month. I can understand why he would say, "Go ahead and do this." And I'm not saying that's what happened. But that is the most charitable explanation I can come up with for why he would do this. According to Chris Coffey, uh, he was threatened with arrest. I also don't know why they would be arresting him. I, you know, he, I have no explanation for what, what their justification would be for arresting him. So I'm, I'm, oh, I, I, I'm not going to claim to know if that's what happened. But that is, that is what he says occurred. Um, but if, if there was a good reason for the euthanizations to have been done, then probably the way it should have been done would be through chemical means, that the snakes would have been sedated and then euthanized chemically. Um, however, methods similar to those employed, similar to but not exactly those employed, and I'll explain how they're different, are among the recommended ways to humanely euthanize a reptile. Um, one of the misconceptions that I've seen around in a number of places and I never bought from the very beginning was that this was done with a nail gun. That, that never, in, in, you know, even before I had almost any other information, I was like, it, what, they didn't do it with a nail gun, right? Like that would be a major, major scandal and, and difficult to explain why, I mean, you know, you like, I mean, that, that would be no more shocking than if they did it with lawn darts. Like, that, would, that just made no sense at all. And, and I was pretty sure this would be a captive bolt, which is what it was. A, cap, a captive bolt is a, a, a machine designed specifically for the euthanization of animals. And the, this will be the most graphic thing I describe. And I will, try, I will keep it in, in as non-graphic of terms as I can. But I, I do have to explain to you mechanistically what they were supposed to do. So if you're going to use a captive bolt, which they're supposed to only do under emergency situations, which would usually be they've got some animal in the wild that needs to be euthanized right away, or, or you've got a deer that's been hit by a car, or a giant snake that's been hit by a car and it's suffering there on the side of the road, and they just need to put it down as quickly as possible, then you would use the captive bolt. And, in the, but not just the captive bolt. So the captive bolt, what it is, is you know, it's got a, it's got a kind of a, a big, kind of a hammer-like pin that comes that, that comes out as a projectile, but then stops. That's the captive portion of the bolt, and and, and you you apply it right to the brain. You know, they, they they try to hit the brain as directly as they can with it. A hit from a captive bolt, in many 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 instances, as long as it's administered properly, will be fatal. But it might not be immediately fatal. What it should do at the very least is render an animal unconscious. Once the animal is unconscious, what you're supposed to do is something called pithing, where you introduce an object, honestly, I've seen in many of these things, like a screwdriver, uh, into 
the brain case of the animal and stir it around in order to ensure that the entire brain is destroyed. I will not describe anything else in graphic detail after that. That is, that, that, that should be the end of that. But the reason that you do pithing is to ensure that A, they don't wake up again, and B, they can't suffer, right? Once the, all the neural tissue has been uh, mechanically destroyed in this way, they're, they're, you know, there's no more suffering, at least in the way that we conceptualize suffering. If the nervous system is still reacting, it's doing it at like the spinal cord level. Uh, and, and so all, all processing of the unpleasantness of, of what has happened should cease. Um, and that is, under emergency circumstances, an acceptable means of euthanization. They did only the first part of that, which was the use of the captive bolt. They did not do the pithing for, I have no idea what reason. Uh, laziness, poor training, lack of compassion. There are lots of possible explanations for that, and that's a question that I also still need to dig into to, to see if there's any sort of explanation provided. None was given in the official report that I read. Um, perhaps something will show up in the body cam. It's something I can inquire of FWC about further in the future because I do think there's more of this story to tell. And, and so as, I, as more information becomes available to me, I will try to make it available to you guys. Um, yeah, this is, it's awful on so many levels. Um, government in general is a, very necessary no, I'm, I'm no anarchist, right? but government often makes mistakes and, and bad things happen. You know, one, one of the things that, that obviously happened here was a bobo was misidentified. And, and, and I've seen a lot of people talking about how it was deliberately misidentified. I've watched that portion, portion of the video many, many times. And to my eye, I don't see evidence of that. Uh, what I do see... So, so, you know, a lot has been made of the fact that they took a lot of photographs of the dead animal. And I will tell you, and this didn't occur to me until I was learning more about the full report even before I got it, which was that the report was well over 100 pages and the written portion was 10 pages and the rest is photographs. They need to document everything they did. And so they needed to be taking extensive numbers of photographs to document that each of the animals that were there that were supposed to be euthanized were euthanized and that it was done semi-properly. Uh, you know, they, they needed to document that for their report. And, and so, I, you know, I, I, there, there may have been photographs, additional photographs taken as well, perhaps some that didn't show proper reverence for the situation. Totally valid, but there is a, a, a good explanation for why they would have taken a lot of photographs. Um, trying to think if there was something else I was leading into before I, I went off on the photographs tangent. But um, yeah, so, so but I, I think just there was no explanation in the report itself about why they only used the captive bolt and didn't engage in the pit. And, and I'll let you know about that. Um, the, as far as the mistake, that's what I was talking about. As far as the mistake goes, I know to those of us that are passionate reptile enthusiasts, it is inconceivable that a person could take a boa and mistake it for a reticulated python or a Burmese python. But, and I'm making up my statistics on this, I think if you would be to poll the average American, uh, at least 98% would not know the difference between them uh, by, by sight. And, and I also understand that FWC officers, because they are in charge of enforcing the law, should be more knowledgeable about these things than the average citizen. And that's true and, and definitely, I mean, I, I, I totally appreciate that. But you know, when you're moving quickly through this many animals, that kind of a mistake can happen. And, and why I was talking about this before is when I noticed that they noticed was when he stopped to photograph the tag on the enclosure. That's when he saw boa. 
And that's when he remembered all of the times they'd been warned, don't kill the boa. Uh, I've looked through all the photographs. Most of the enclosures were labeled retic or berm, but some were not. Some were just the morph. And I, you know, I, I really am not sure how much they were reading those tags before they were getting them, because it was basically everything in that area and they were moving quickly. It's, it's, it's awful and it shouldn't have happened and training should be better. I also don't see it as some hit job on, on the boa or, or an attempt to make that mistake. And that mistake is a lot of what is causing FWC big problems right now, which frankly opens up an important opportunity for us to uh, change the way things are being done in the state of Florida. Um, that's a good start to my basic thoughts. Do we have any, any specific questions at this time? We have so many super chats to catch up on. Okay, well let's, let's do a few of those. I, and again, I'm, I'm gonna, I sh there shouldn't be a reason that I need to get into graphic detail again. I, in fact, if I need to talk about you know, what, what pithing or captive bolt do, I will just reference you to earlier in the video when that was described. Uh, just want to thank, you. Oh, this is uh, Tipping Scales sent a super chat saying, just want to thank you for emphasizing the need to remain professional and not making threats and us being stewards of this community. This is, I mean, this is going to be a heck of a challenge for us because I, I honestly can scarcely imagine a situation that would more warrant outrage. And I'm, I'm, I'm really actually totally okay with outrage. I'll, I'll get to this a little bit in my what I think we should do, which is actually coming up very shortly. But, but uh, one of the things that we can't allow to happen is for this to just be forgotten. It, it needs to remain at the forefront of our thoughts and the thoughts of FWC until this is addressed in a way that is, uh, make something good happen from that. Uh, we got a super chat from M. Uh, M says, hi Clint, thank you for providing information on this issue. As a nurse in vet med, that has seen too much myself. I found this pretty disturbing. I agree completely. Thank you. Oz sent a super chat saying, Oz. hello Clint. Thank you for having this conversation with folks. Happy to be here and to the audience, join US ARC and US ARC Florida. And you know, US ARC and US ARC Florida are advocacy groups. They're gonna catch a lot of the legislation going through that, you know, a situation like this, you know, and possibly a big part of the problem is laws could get changed and you'd never even know about it. And you could suddenly be in violation of the laws and they could potentially come and legally take everything that you have and euthanize it. And you wouldn't even know you were violating the law if it wasn't for US ARC alerting us to a lot of these things. And then on top of that, they try to advocate for us and, and keep these things from, from, changing, from changing. But supporting US ARC and US ARC Florida can be very, very important and can be a, a really great thing to do at this time. Uh, Professional Zombie 12 sent a super chat saying, uh, please send Bill McAdams and especially Chris Coffey my regards. I sobbed for an hour while clutching my very sweet CRB. Uh, when I saw that video, I can't imagine the pain. I think that's a Colombian rainbow boa. And uh, I, I totally understand that feeling. Hopefully, hopefully they'll, they'll see this, or if I get a chance to speak to them directly, I'll try to pass that along. Uh, Kat sent a super chat saying, how likely is this to happen in other countries? I can hardly imagine this happening where I live. I would say very likely. You know, it, 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 it's gonna depend on what the laws are like, but if, it, the reality is euthanizing invasive animals is not uncommon, you know, all over the world. And if you're keeping them uh, and, and the laws change out from under you, there might not be much to protect you. Um, 
And so it's, it's hopefully, you know, that, that's why this incident is so important because if government bodies can see that, you know, this, this really made them look bad and did them a lot of damage, uh, it, might, it might cause other bodies to second guess doing, you know, to think twice before doing something like this. I know FWC from my conversations with them, like they, like I said, they know they made mistakes and they are making changes already. And, you know, they haven't been public about exactly what those changes are and, and we need to hold them to that and, and hopefully also weigh in on what those changes should be. But they, they know they messed up and, and that's a pretty rare situation. It, 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 can't, it can't fade away without us making something good happen. Uh, Paraplaneta Missionary sent a super chat saying the FWC needs to be defunded. They have more than enough resources if they can so easily go after private citizens rather than manage resources. I, I I won't express an opinion about defunding them, but I definitely think some changes need to be made at the very least to the way that their their funds are used in order to ensure that these sorts of outcomes aren't occurring in the future. Amanda Mildfelt sent a super chat saying, how can we help try and prevent something like this from happening again, even if we don't reside in the state of Florida? Did I get to that? Yeah. Do you have my thoughts? Yeah. So I, uh, I, I have next on our docket are misconceptions I want to correct, and I'll, I'll go through those just quickly. Uh, and then I will get to what I think we should do now. So I've already talked about this one, but this wasn't done with a nail gun. This was done with captive bolt. That's, that's a common misconception I've seen for, on our side. Um, something I've seen in the reporting and coming from FWC is that the reticulated pythons, which the bulk of these animals were reticulated pythons. I think only five or six of them were Burmese pythons. Um, that reticulated pythons are invasive in the state of Florida. There is no evidence for this. There's, there's strong, overwhelming evidence that Burmese pythons are invasive in Florida. I, I think there's reason to believe it is possible for reticulated pythons to become invasive in Florida. Yeah, reticulated pythons, as, as we saw as the case here, occasionally show up in the wild in Florida. They also show up occasionally in the wild in Minnesota and in Utah. The, the question isn't, do we sometimes see giant snakes get released? Because this is, this is honestly one of the situations where we as a community have a problem. I, I love giant snakes and I, I think that there should always be a path to being able to keep them, but a problem is that keepers overwhelmingly that buy baby giant snakes are not prepared for giant snakes. Often they get passed from home to home to home to home to home from people who think they're going to be able to handle a giant snake. Oftentimes people get 10 reticulate, baby reticulated pythons. I, I've had many people online when I've talked about how difficult it is to keep a reticulated python, they're like, I've got 30 reticulated pythons. It's not hard at all. And I'm like, well, how big are they? It's like, oh, one of them's eight feet long. I'm like, hmm, there's the thing. An eight-foot reticulated python is a totally reasonable animal. A 28-foot reticulated python is a completely unreasonable animal. And while you've got 38-foot or smaller reticulated pythons, you have no idea what it would be like having one adult female reticulated python. You have no idea what that's like. And so people think, oh, I'll get 30 babies. By the time they're big, I'll be totally prepared for that. And they're just not. And they get passed around home to home to home to home, and they get euthanized all the time. And sometimes people who don't have the heart to euthanize them slow euthanize them by releasing them into the wild where they can't survive, hoping, I guess, that somebody else will pick them up and deal with their problem. They don't have to deal with it anymore in a place like Florida, potentially, so that they could uh, establish a population. This is why I think that the conditional species permit was such a good idea uh, in the state of Florida. That was, that was a good program, in my, in my view. Um, when they make it prohibited now, 
Your only path to getting one is to do it illegally. And if you do it illegally, then what's to prevent you from doing other illegal things like releasing it into the wild? Um, and so I think, I think it's bad policy, generally speaking, to have switched these to, to where there is no legal path. I think, I think generally speaking, for, for animals, if there is a legal path to be had for anyone, that legal path should be available to everyone. Anybody who's willing to, you know, like I don't, I don't think you should get a tiger. Um, but if there is a legal path to getting one, which I'm sure should at least uh, mean that you're caring for it appropriately, that you're providing uh, an, uh, you know, a zoo quality habitat for it with the sorts of defenses that zoos have to prevent it from getting out into the public. If you're willing to do all that, then that path should be open to you because otherwise the only path is the illegal path. And, and that's a messed up path. You know, the, that, that is the, the, that's not good for anyone. It's not going to be good for the animals. It's not going to be good for the general public. It's not going to be good for the hobby in the case that, you know, you, you have an illegal Burmese python or a reticulated python. Now it's a giant. What do I do with it? Well, I can't let anybody know I had it. And so the only thing I'll do is I'll just dump it out. So they do turn up. There is no evidence, though, that they're reproducing in the wild so far. And, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm open to the possibility that evidence could show up in the future, but as far as we know right now, they're not invasive. And, uh, oh, there's been a lot of discussion of an FWC officer uh, named uh, William Lee Lashi. He's been connected with this incident as being one of the officers that was there present. He has been, I think, uh, arrested and charged with some very, very serious crimes. He, however, was not in any way involved with what happened on, on April 6th, um, or, or with this at all. And, and the last thing I had was the photographs, which I think I've already covered. There's a lot of reasons that they were taking photographs for their official reports. Um, what do I think we should do now? I think we need to be persistent, patient, and polite. Um, that wasn't on my notes. But that is what I think we need to do. We can't let this fade away. So we need to we need to be there, reminding everyone consistently, not letting this fade away because this is this is so important, but it could easily just be yesterday's headline. You know, who do you do you even remember the thing that we were all outraged about two months ago? And I'm not talking about the reptile hobby, I'm talking about the American people. The, the world. What were, what were we upset about two months ago? I don't know. We've moved on to some new thing to be outraged about. This can't fade away. This can't fade away or these sorts of things will happen and they may happen with greater regularity. If you can just hunker down for a few days and it blows over, we forget about it, everybody forgets about it. As far as um, we need to be polite, so, so, so we need to be persistent about it. We need to be patient. We need to make sure that we have all the information. We need to make sure we're not spreading misinformation. We need to, we need to wait for some of the information to pre pre present itself. And we need, to be, we need to be polite. We need to be kind, respectful, there, right, in their ear, but not, not threatening, not the kind of things that are going to turn public support away from the reptile community. Right now, we are the victims. What we don't want to do is turn law enforcement in this situation into the victim. In, in which case, you better believe uh, that they're going to crack down on us more. That's not good. You don't want that. Um, I, yeah, I've already said, you know, no, no misinformation, no threats. Right? I'm, I'm doing my best to spread really quality information. I know there are others that are doing so as well. When, when the body cam footage becomes available, uh, we're, we're working on potentially being able to make that available to you guys to see. Uh, I don't know if you'd want to see it in its entirety or an edited version of it. We'll, we'll figure that out, uh, but hopefully that will be possible. Um, oh, this is so important. I, I don't even know where to begin. Do not make this political. That is the biggest single mistake I think we could possibly make here. Um, right now, the reptile hobby is not a left-right thing. The, the reptile hobby is made out of people on the political left, the political right, the political center, the political apathetic. 
we are not united by our political stances. We are, we are united by our love for these animals. The moment that we make this political, just like that, half of, we don't have 50% support right now. Well, we might. We might. Say we, say, we have, say we have 90% public support right now. Well, suddenly, half of it's gone. We're down to 45% support just like that because humans are extremely, extremely tribal. They are extremely tribal, and that has made great sense, and it's been very important for us as a species for a long, long time. But the moment that you make this about people's tribe, instead of about a horrible tragedy and somebody who is suffering and animals that were brutally and needlessly killed, but you make it about politics because, well, all of a sudden, all of this is is, is a, a pawn, uh, you know, a chess piece for you to use in your bigger war because you're really more concerned with taking on the government of the state of Florida or the United States or, or fighting some other battle. But you have, you have probably caused us to lose this battle. And if you actually care about this, you will keep other politics out of it entirely. Um, if you have more questions about that, I'd be happy to answer them. I'm, you know, uh, human tribal psychology is something that I've studied extensively. My, my PhD is, uh, my PhD research was on how to teach evolution so that people can accept it. Uh, I'm, I study controversial topics and how to talk to people about them in a way that doesn't drive divisiveness. And I will tell you, that, that, that tribal psychology is extraordinarily important and it will destroy everything we're fighting for if we drag other politics into this. Don't do it. Um, yeah, my, my, my last thing, and this is, this is, I think, I've already talked about this, but it's, it's what I really hope can happen here. Is that, is that something can happen in the state of Florida like what has happened in Utah and that that can spread, which is that FWC, um, they're an imperfect organization. I like to think they're trying their best, but a lot of times they don't have the resources or, or at least they don't have the most competent people to assess all possible interests. There might not really be anybody within FWC who they respect and trust that is advocating for us. Right now, though, we have an opportunity to talk to them where they're a little bit on the ropes about this. And they might be more open than ever to listening, and especially if we're coming in it in a, in a polite and helpful way, offering to be an ally instead of an enemy, going back to that tribal psychology. People are unreasonably accepting of ideas that come from, from people they view as part of their tribe. And they are unreasonably skeptical and unreasonably quick to reject ideas that come from outside of their perceived tribe. If we come at them as enemies, we will be treated as enemies. And you do not want to be FWC's enemy if you live in the state of Florida. You do not want that. If you want to ensure that you're never allowed to keep reptiles again and they euthanize everything you have, Okay, maybe you want to be their enemy, but you do not want to be their enemy. Um, and so my hope is that people who genuinely could help FWC to draft its policy going forward, that, that, that also care about the needs of the reptile community, but are willing to completely embrace the core mission of FWC in protecting the native environment in Florida, will step in to help out. And, and that's one of the biggest things that I can ask for. And that, that might not be you, but, but you can support them. And, and something else, just going back to, to what I said earlier about keeping this in the media. Anything you see, like any videos you see about this on YouTube or in the media, watch them. If they're, if they're good, you know, like they might, they might be doing a lot of the things that like we need to avoid. But if they're really good, share them. Try to keep this message out there and in the, 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 the attention of 
our government leaders, and of uh, the people. Um, if we allow this to fade away, nothing good will come from this. Um, okay. I have my good news coming up, but I think we need to, I probably have about 10,000 questions to answer. Yes, and I realize we need to uh, we need to switch over to Patreon for a little bit. Oh goodness, we have, have Patreon questions. questions, to questions to okay, read. I will try to be some. Hopefully, at this point, I've said a lot of what I have to say, and so I can keep it short. Okay, I'm gonna kind of focus on the most popular ones for the time being. Uh, Sydney, a patron over on Patreon, said, uh, "What is the value of restrictions on keeping exotic reptiles in Florida?" And what should the responses be to the Holy, Trini the Holy Thursday massacre in relation to these restrictions, while also addressing the horrific nature of the event and its root causes, such as sheer incompetence and lack of proper procedures within the FWC? Hopefully I've covered a lot of that already. Um, but the, the first, what was the first point made there? The value of restrictions. The, va the value of restrictions. You know, in a state like Utah, I, I think a lot of the restrictions are unnecessary. In a state like Florida, some of them probably are necessary just because everything could live there. And they have like 500 established invasive species in the state of Florida, including, I mean, things that are way more destructive than the Burmese pythons, like cats and dogs and pigs. They've got an established population of macaque monkeys that have hepatitis. Okay, they, 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 they have everything. Uh, it is unbelievable, you know, and so they are really fighting a battle there. They're fighting a serious, serious battle, and I understand their need to put some, some regulations on things. I wish that wasn't the case, but, but it, it, it's, it, it is certainly justifiable and probably necessary. Uh, also on Patreon, Patreon, a patron named Davis Reptile Lab said, no real questions, but the actions of FWC largely played into our decision to move our family out of Florida and up to Indiana. Really heartbreaking what we keep seeing. My cheeky question would be, why do we think it's acceptable for to have real estate developers on a board for a fish and wildlife commission and no biologists or herpetologists. It's almost like they don't really, or they don't actually care about the Florida ecosystem when uh, they kill people's pets who are secure in captivity and not a threat to wildlife, but approve clearing more wetlands and forests and approving the filling of gopher tortoise burrows to build yet another luxury apartment complex. Now it's complicated and that goes beyond my understanding of the inner workings of FWC, but that's exactly what I'm talking about in that we need voices inside of FWC. We, this is our opportunity, I think, to get in there. Andre Nihilist says, uh, who do you believe legislators ought to be working with to solve this ongoing issue of government overreach? Who do I think legislators ought to be working with? Mm -hmm. Well, us. Um, but I, I do think that's another totally fair thing to do, which would be to contact your representatives about your feelings regarding this. And if you can avoid dragging other politics into that, then you could have bipartisan support of you know, maybe ensuring that FWC's uh, policies and everything become maybe a little bit different going forward. Uh, also a patron on Patreon, uh, T. Swizzle says... These names are the best. You know. <laughs> As someone not living in Florida, what can I do to help in this situation? I'm sure supporting U.S. ARC and U.S. ARC Florida are the best options. I'd, I would just like to help in a more active way from where I'm at. That's understandable. You know, there, I, know I know there are things uh, for, for support of of uh, uh, Chris Coffey and, and Bill McAdam as well. Um, you know, and, and then th the thing is, this isn't just a Florida thing. You know, I, I adore, and I've mentioned this many times, what is going on here in Utah 
And the laws are just becoming better and better, which is not typical. If you have an expertise that would help the government to craft better policy in the future in your state or wherever you are located, uh, make sure that, that you make that known to them. And, and uh, you know, take an active role in, in changing the policies where you are in addition to in Florida. Anthony Simone over on Patreon says, uh, for the first time I can remember this horrible incident has actually seemed to swing the public perception of reptiles and reptile keepers in a positive way in that the public is feeling great sympathy for the animals lost and the owner of those sadly lost snakes. Do you feel that this sympathy and this outpouring of goodwill towards the individual who tragically lost their animals will impact the reptile community as a whole and people will begin to see us less as weirdos who like to keep snakes and instead see us as what we've truly been all along, loving caretakers of wonderful and amazing animals. Obviously, I'm not intending to diminish what happened and this is a tragic and utterly horrific event that I wish never occurred. So if it seems like I'm doing so in any way, I apologize. Uh, I will just say that those are my exact hopes. That's the way it seems to me as of this moment is that you know, for, unlike anything I've ever seen, we have great public support and they are, they're, they're treating the snakes like they were cats or dogs in news coverage, you know, and, and, and the way people are speaking out. And, you know, that's monumental. I, I mean, you know, as much as I, I do want the Everglades protected, I mean, you would, it, dogs and cats are a major problem in the Everglades as well. But you would never see something like this done to dogs and cats because the public outcry would be too great and because they're too adored by too many people. And, uh, you know, snakes have been an easy victim. They're an easy target because they're the bad guy. It's easy to want to craft policy, and, you know, and there will be widespread public support generally of crackdown on those wicked snakes. It didn't, not, not this time. And so we can't squander this opportunity to change something for good. Lemon Land on Patreon says, since seeing that video, I have been spending a lot of time with my scaly baby as I'm sure a lot of people are. I'd hope, uh, me being from the UK, I don't have to experience anything like this. My question is, I'm just wondering if there's a reptile support system between different states for, an, for in instances where someone needs to get rid of an animal quickly when they are prohibited, they'd like to be able to call out for people in the group to aid in helping relocate. To my knowledge, there isn't something like that yet. And I think that's another great thing that, that could happen from this. And it's something that if you're one of those people outside of Florida who wants to find a way to make a big difference, start, start collaborating. See if we can build something as a community because I think this is something that is very much needed. And, and, and it wouldn't even just be limited to situations like this. There are lots of reasons that people get themselves in over their head. And there are rescues, like the Phoenix Herpetological Sanctuary, that is just inundated with some of these. I mean, the Phoenix Herpetological Sanctuary at any given time has like three to 500 adult sulcata tortoises that need homes. You know, if we had some nation, I don't know if there are that many proper homes for adult sulcatas in the United States. But if there are, we need someone to connect everybody. Stop buying baby tortoises. If you wanted a giant tortoise, there are loads. Uh, Anna Barach over on Patreon says, uh, I'm new to the reptile community. My eight-year-old son and I have been volunteering at a, an, at a reptile rescue for six months, and we've since welcomed our first snake to our family. But before that, I wasn't familiar with this world at all. My son and I are the only reptile people among our family and friends. So my question, aside from donating to US Ark, what can I do to be a good representative of the reptile community? I would say just 
share your love for these animals in, in as many little public ways as you can. You know, if it's, if it's on social media and stuff like that. You know, a lot of these animals are absolute monsters until people really get to be around them. And, and that's a total game changer. So I would say that's a great way. Uh, Samuel Strasberg over on Patreon says, do you think there will be any ramifications for the actions of these individuals slash the organization that did this? That's a very good question. Um, mistakes were made. I don't know yet until I have a little bit more of this information exactly how egregious. Mistakes were definitely made and uh, restitution probably needs to be made at least for the, the loss of the legal animal and, and its offspring. Um, you know, as far as what kind of consequences for the officers, you know, I, I, I think at the very least greater training is required. A lot of policy needs to change and, and possibly discipline against the officers, you know, depending on the level of negligence, uh, you know, the, the fact that they didn't follow proper procedures and that likely led to a great deal of animal suffering. There's a lot of possibilities here, and I'm not a legal expert, especially on the laws in the state of Florida, to tell you exactly what they should be. Uh, Barbara P Perry over on Patreon says, will there, be, will there ever be an official inquiry into this debacle with a view to remove, remove the decision makers involved and find better or different ways to deal with these situations like this in the future. I'm hoping that the public outcry will at least prompt an investigation, even purely from a political standpoint, it can't look good for FWC because it's unlikely that just the fact that it was an inhumane, completely unnecessary act will, will matter to the people involved, who we all know have an agenda based on making money and not protecting wildlife. Well, you know, it'll, it'll depend on if we allow this to be forgotten. That's the biggest thing. And, and I, I hope we do not. Um, how, how close are we to through Patreon? Last thing, Last just thing. a quick comment from George Ann. Uh, George Ann says, I can't believe this. It is just heartbreaking. My, my prayers to the owner and dad of these things. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, 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 want, but I think we have more questions to tackle, but I do want to share that I do have some good news. And I think we could all use a little good news. So one piece of good news, uh, as far as I'm concerned, is... Uh, you guys seem to enjoy very much our video about black mambas that that came out this month. Uh, that was a lot of fun. Uh, it, it seems, generally speaking, videos about the more dangerous animals are the most popular. And I can tell you that beginning uh, with our first video in the month of May, all of May is going to be very, very dangerous. And... Uh, so, so gear up because coming here within a, in about a week is murderous May. Okay, and uh, uh, additional, oh, I've got some really big news. So um, we got something pretty amazing from an incredible artist in Canada called Riverside Creations. And when, when I was at the enclosure build-off at uh, uh, at the Snake Discovery Zoo, they had this incredible Snake Discovery sign there, and I, I loved it. I took all kinds of pictures of it and all this stuff. Well, the creators of that sign are also fans of Clint's Reptiles, and they said that they wanted to send us one. And I can tell you, it has been a nightmare, and that a chunk of the sign, uh, we, we had it shipped to, to the local FedEx. For some reason, they rejected it, and we found out they rejected it right away, but because it's an international package, they would not stop it. And it got sent all the way back to Canada. And it has now arrived here. And I am in the process of assembling all of the pieces. So there's going to be some clamps. But I want you to see this because it is glorious and amazing. And it is just too incredible. Oh, <laughs> 
you can't even see it. It's colossal and it's amazing. How incredible is this? I, I just, I could not be more excited. Uh, thank you so much Riverside Creations for making this and sending it to us. It's gonna go in a very prominent place here in the reptile room and I am very, very beside myself with excitement about that. And uh, I, I, along those lines, we at, at Clint's Reptile Room um, have never, we never got to make the reptile room the way that we wanted it to be. Um, as, as many of you know, we, we created this with, with your support. Um, and we, we moved into the reptile room here in Springville, Utah in December of 2019. With plans, uh, I needed to finish up my, my dissertation and, and build everything the way that we wanted it to be with plans to open up summer of 2020. Now, I don't know if you guys know what happened in early 2020, but some sort of like a, it was like, what did they call that thing? Uh, yeah. It was like a pandemic. Yeah. yeah, that came a sweeping through. I don't know if you heard about it. It was on the news, though, for a while there. Uh, and that dramatically changed things. And the, the reptile room has never been exactly what we originally intended for it to be. It has been awesome because we have soft opened it uh, for, for years now. And uh, people come here and they have exactly the kinds of experiences we wanted them to have. But it, it has never been yet what we wanted it to be. This year, though, we're changing that. We're finally in a position where we're getting to turn it into what we originally wanted for it to be. And uh, more details will be emerging, but this, this fall, we will be having our official grand opening. And uh, we're, we're gonna have a lot of awesome friends from, that, that you guys uh, likely know from YouTube here. We've got some really, really fun events planned and it should be a blast. And also, uh, hopefully there will be opportunities for you to come and, and meet some of, some of the, the people you like the most. So, so uh, start looking at your schedules for this fall for the Clint's Reptile Room Grand Opening. We're really excited about that. Um, I, ha I, I know we have a lot more questions and I wanna save time for those, but I do have one, one piece of terrible news that you probably are already aware of, but in case you're not, I, I haven't had a chance to talk about it. And, and that is about the health of our friend Brian Barczyk. Um, if you saw the Black Mamba video, you know that we've been talking with Brian for some time. We have plans to go visit him sometime later this year. However, since the time that we made those plans, he has been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, which is not one of the cancers that, that you want to get. Uh, and he is, he has exactly the right attitude about it. And he, you know, of all the people who can take this on, you know, he, he's, He's a person who's always, I think, lived his dreams, and now he's fighting for his dreams. Um, but I just, you know, I wanted to, to definitely bring that to your attention if it wasn't something you were aware of already, and just encourage you to show him love and support at this time. I, I know it's a great sense of strength to him, and he, he, needs, he needs that help. So, you know, if you're looking for a, a good way to to change the world for the better, to, to make a positive impact today, just jump over to his latest video and leave a, a really kind comment. Do, do something, do something to, to show your support there. Um, but I, I definitely wanted to bring that to your attention and I, I'd be happy to talk more about it uh, at a future date, but I know you've probably got places to be and I have a lot of questions to answer about these subjects. So uh, let's pick up there. So many questions. Oh my. And, we're good, that mean, and we kind of moved on. So we're gonna yeah yeah we we'll swing back. back around. Well, I yeah. figured I figured we would, but I wanted to make sure before and, you know people started to leave that. Uh, but there are a lot of questions yet to be answered, and these are ones that have come up during the live stream. So the Patreon questions came before. These are maybe even super more chats during the live stream. Okay, that's right. Uh, from like an hour ago, actually. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we have a lot. Usually with a live stream, the idea is like you have three minutes of something to talk about, and then you just talk about whatever for the rest of the time. This is like, I've got an hour's worth of really important information to share. And now we'll try to answer questions. 
uh, uh, Sean R Rousel sent a super chat saying, how could anyone be rude to Clint? I can't think of a nicer, most stinking rad guy. Well, thank you very, very much. I, I really appreciate it. I, I will tell you, um, if you're going to be rude to somebody, I can, I can handle it. It'll be okay. Uh, Kate, Pick me. <laughs> Kate Wolf. Don't, don't take him literally on that one. <laughs> yeah, Kate, Jason knows I can't handle it. <laughs> uh, Kate Wolf sent a super chat saying, Thank you, Clint, for providing us with the most accurate information possible. We should promote more education on reptiles. I agree 100%, and that's one of the outcomes that I hope I hope comes out of this, is that more people, including law enforcement, maybe I should share a little story. I'll, I'll try to keep it relatively short. But I once lived in a city that had some pretty harsh reptile laws. And among their laws is a law against keeping venomous snakes or lizards, which I find totally reasonable. Uh, but I will tell you, the law enforcement officer, I spoke, I spoke to the animal control officer one time who read that, that section of the law prohibiting venomous snakes or lizards. And he didn't read it to mean venomous snakes or venomous lizards. He just read it to mean no venomous snakes and no lizards of any kind. And so there's a lot of room to uh, educate the public. And sometimes, sometimes it's people in law enforcement. Uh, and, and unfortunately, really bad things can happen. And so hopefully the more we can spread good information, the more it'll infiltrate all over the place. Uh, Ren Gone Mad sent a super chat saying, will this change the humane way to euthanize? I don't know if it'll change the official policy, but I think it will hopefully at least increase the likelihood that it is done properly, especially if there are consequences in situations where it is done improperly like this one. Uh, Intrepid Exotics sent a super chat saying, do you have access to any ecosystem research that's not from FSU or FL, uh, Florida, that details the current invasive impacts on native wildlife? I've wondered if the actual berm impact is overstated by the state to empower FWC. There's definitely been some research that's a little bit questionable. I, I know uh, Phil Goss was talking to me about this a little bit today. And, you know, and, and the reality is, I mean, the animals that do the most damage are, are things like cats, you know, cats, pigs. The number of animals that a cat will kill versus the number of animals that a snake, even a large snake will kill is just, there's no, no even, no comparison, no comparison. Um, but cats are a difficult enemy. There's too much public support for them. Snakes are easy to go after. And yeah, I, I don't think there's great evidence showing massive, massive. So, so, so some of the stuff that's, that's been done is showing like a correlation between when the snakes became invasive and when some mammal population started to decline. The question is, is it causative? Is it because of the, the pythons? Because there's a heck of a lot of other things that happened in South Florida in that same time period that would be devastating to mammals, likely even in the absence of large pythons. Okay, I got, oh well, man, I got lost. Give me a second. Okay. Okay, I think I found it. Uh, uh, Benology. Uh, sent a super chat. Just send in a super chat. Thank you, Benology. Uh, Eric Wall sent a super chat saying, I have been a reptile lover since I was a kid. You got me back into it. And now, to my wife's dismay, I have had my white throat for one year Ooh. tomorrow. That's pretty rad. Probably starting to get some size on it. Uh, Selena Lee sent a super chat saying, I have family in the news media. Should I ask them to report on this? Absolutely. We don't live in Florida, but I feel everyone needs to be aware of this tragedy. This, is, this has been a nationwide, uh, nationwide news story. And so, yes, absolutely. The more public attention that this can get, probably the better. Because it is, you know, again, I, I, don't, I don't want us to be, 
uh, you know, uh, cruel, but we can't let this be forgotten. And so it needs to stay in the public eye. Okay. Uh, let's see. Zach Knudsen uh, sent a super chat saying, as horrendous as this tragedy is, the reptile community as a whole needs to remember that we are all under a magnifying glass. Mm -hmm. Rets against FWC will only result in a harder time for everyone here. Yes. Thank you. And thank you, thank you for making that point because that's, yeah. Not so temporary account sent a super chat saying, Chris was coerced by the FWC into giving his snakes to Big Brother. He didn't choose to sign that paper. He was threatened with jail time slash felonies. All right, so I think we're, we're talking about um, the, the February 2022 incident when he signed them over. Um, and he was definitely concerned about the fact that charges were being filed against him. To my knowledge, um, you know, that they, they were still filed even though he did that. I mean, yes, I mean, I don't think he had too much of an option there and, and whether or not that was within the legal purview of FWC, I don't know. And that's, that's one for lawyers to, to uh, tackle. VW Hybrid sent a super chat saying, is someone starting legislation to make sure this never happens again. Give me something solid to back, and I'm there 100%. Well, that would be a situation where you need to contact the lawmakers. Uh, this is something that, that US Arc and US Arc Florida might be spearheading, and so you can start there um, by asking or requesting it, asking them what, what they have in mind, and contacting your lawmakers. Uh, Voodoo Boy sent a super chat saying, this is a stain on the raggedy old flag of our country and needs to be eradicated immediately. Well, I don't know exactly. Eradicated is a, is a word that is uh, a, little, a little sticky, but definitely this is something that needs to be remedied. Uh, Shazane sent a super chat saying, someone wants you to put on closed captions. Uh, unfortunately, that's not something yeah, that live. YouTube supports on live. Yep. Uh, I think this is the second one from uh, Dark Wings Inc. Sent a super chat saying, how did the officers not get nailed yanking the retics out of their cages? Must have been really tame and trusting snakes. What I saw was brutal. Couldn't make it through the whole video. Um, so I know, I know at the beginning, Chris Coffey was assisting them with getting the snakes out. The, the reality is, at least in my experience with retics, you know, retics, they're not aggressive snakes. They just really like food. And so if you can communicate to them that they're not going to receive food, they can be very, very easy to, to handle. He, I, I know that, um, Chris Coffey was, was instructing them how to communicate to the snakes that it was not feeding time, which is by petting them with a snake hook. And, and so as long as you do that, honestly, the likelihood of being bitten is very low. Um, you know, and, and, and they, they were also, I mean, they were, they'd reach in there and they were restraining them behind the head. I mean, they were handling them in a fairly, in a way you would never want to handle your pet snake because you would break all trust with it, of course. Uh, what was about to happen was much worse still. You know, th these are probably techniques that are more justifiable in the field than they are with pet snakes, by far. Uh, Indigo Eclipse sent a super chat saying, thanks for your videos. I'm getting into the hobby with garter snakes, but I can't figure out which breeds are legal in Georgia and concerned for snakes. Mm, that's a very good question. And yeah, you just have to consult your, your state laws. You can also uh, contact a breeder and see if they have any insight. Somebody like Don's Garters would be a great place to go. Uh, Voodoo Boy sent another super chat saying they broke the law and should have and could have been shot 
and I wouldn't have batted an eye at it. That's how egregious they were. I don't know. I, yeah, I definitely am not advocating for vigilante justice of any kind. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's a really, really tricky situation. But, I, you know, I, I let, you know, if the, the truth is that Chris Coffey requested the euthanizations, then the fact that they euthanized the snakes was justifiable, perhaps not in the means, and means that they used, and I'm still not exactly sure why they listened to him, but it, there wouldn't have been anybody there to have uh, resisted what they were doing. Uh, Sean Roussel said, would zoos not take them? That's what a lot of people with giant snakes think is going to happen when they need to get rid of them is, oh, well, I'll give it to the zoo. Well, the reality is the zoo's got one, and they've got another one, and they've got, you know, 700 of them that have been offered to them. And they don't really want your morphs, and that's what you have. And there just, there aren't enough zoos for the number of big snakes that need new homes. Uh, Lindsay K sent a super chat saying, maybe if a government official can't tell the difference between a boa and a python, then they shouldn't be allowed to make euthanasia decisions. Uh, Dark Wings Inc. sent a super chat. Uh, how they smiled as they did it, even worse. Yeah, I, you know, and I, 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 I haven't seen so much of the smiling necessarily like about what they were doing. It seems like they were finding it unpleasant. But, I mean, I can tell you, if, if that was my job, I mean, it would just, it would devastate me. Was, you know, like, I, I, I don't know how I'd carry on. And so the fact that somebody who does that routinely would become calloused and cynical I at least can see how that could happen to a person. Uh, Alex Mullins sent a super chat saying, the most important thing to do now is donate to US Ark, and if you live in Florida or any other state that bans animals, make sure you talk to your state representatives. For everyone else, let's keep the conversation going. Seem like good suggestions. Uh, let's see. Uh, Voodoo Boy sent a super chat. Zyjiz, Zyjix sent a super chat. Thanks, guys. Seth Lanning sent a super chat saying, Greetings from a Florida snake keeper. Uh, I greatly appreciate you covering this topic. Also, my wife and I really enjoyed meeting you back in March. Well, I'm so glad that that opportunity presented itself. Uh, Sinstrel Rifleman sent a super chat saying, this is government in general, ignorant, uncaring bureaucrats enforcing laws written by people who don't understand what they are regulating, uh, previously legal property, now illegal, and people unable to comply in time. These are definitely things that can happen with government. You know, it, it's, it's difficult because government is necessary, but Government, you know, like sometimes, sometimes government is the only one to do a job, but they're often not great at it. Uh, JG sent a super chat uh, that says, and maybe better in the context, why did they have a bolt gun if they weren't? Why did they have a bolt gun if they weren't going there with the intent of euthanizing? The reality is uh, FWC officers are doing... Um, emergency euthanizations uh, on a somewhat regular basis, you know, whether that be with, uh, you know, Burmese pythons and things like that, or you find a deer that's been hit and is just on the side of the road suffering. You know, they, this is probably a standard piece of equipment for them to have in every vehicle, or at least a large percentage of their vehicles. Uh, Zach Cox says... Love what you do, Clint. How much issue do you take with the euthanasia, euthanasia, euthanization, there it is, 
uh, as it was carried out. No pipping. Muscle contractions versus suffering snakes. Oh, it was real bad. Um, I mean, you know, if, if you're going to, like, it's hard to imagine a way where you could do it in a way that is at all normal and do it this badly. I mean, you know, I... I I mean, you, I, I suppose you could not be hitting them anywhere close to the brain. But, you know, all, all, you, you, yeah, I mean, this is, this is about as badly as it can be done with the tools. Because, and, uh, yeah, that's a mess. And I'm certain that changes will be made there. If, I mean, if nothing else happens, that's a place where changes will definitely be made. Uh, Shelby Toll said to Super Chat saying, thank you, all eyes are on us, and we have an opportunity now to work with FWC to prevent this from ever happening again. Absolutely. Uh, not so temporary account sent to Super Chat saying, even if not U.S. resident, you can join U.S. ARC and U.S. ARC Florida. True. Uh, I and a lot of what happens here spreads elsewhere, so... You know, even if you're only self-interested, there's still a good reason to do that. Uh, Irina Greenman sent a super chat to send a super chat. Super chat. Uh, Melissa Hunt sent a super chat. <laughs> Got him still, even with that? Wow. <laughs> Dang it. Um, Melissa Hunt sent a super chat saying, initially, I was enraged after, <coughs> after contemplation it seems clear to me that I had, that had they known the true beauty of these creatures, they would not have been so cruel. Education is key. Know better, do better. That is a very mature and charitable take. And uh, we probably need more of that. Uh, Nini Heart 9 said to Super Chat saying, how did liquidating berms and retics interact with the Lacey app? Hmm. Um, that's a really interesting question. Retics, at the very least, are not regulated uh, currently by the Lacey Act, but moving them out of Florida. That is fascinating. If there was an exemption made or how that worked, because this is dealing with being able to transport some of these animals across state lines. That's a fantastic question, That's, and I don't know the answer. But it seems like they were being allowed to do that. I, I certainly haven't heard of any enforcement permit, uh, uh, preventing people from being able to move them out of the state of Florida. Boy, that'd be something, though. Uh, an, uh, Liam McNaught sent a super chat saying, uh, the FWC thugs took pleasure in the violence, smiles. People like this thrive in positions of power. It's not just a mistake. They had fun. They had so much fun, they didn't notice the boa. I hope that's not the case. Um, you know, that, that goes outside of the facts of the, the situation to sort of an interpretation of the emotional state of the people. Um, you know, if, if that's true, and, and that can be revealed uh, clearly, you know, that makes it much worse. Um, not necessarily from a legal standpoint, but just from a, from an ethical standpoint. It's, it's really twisted. And, and, and it, it's, you know, it, even if it changes nothing for the snakes, you know, it, 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 it furthers the trauma of the humans involved. Uh, Irina Greenman sent a super chat saying, I've read that one of the officers visibly notices this is a legal snake before she was euthanized. Can you comment? I've read that too, which is why I watched this, that segment of the video over and over and over again. Now, they had been notified that there was a legal snake there on multiple occasions, and, but it, it appears to me that nobody processes which snake they're euthanizing until they get to the moment to photograph the tag. And they go, oh, 
I mean, you know, there's an immediate shock and they like look at each other and you can tell they all process it immediately like, oh no. Um, so I don't see that and I looked hard for it, but you know, I, I, I'm not gonna claim that I have a monopoly on the truth there. Uh, Celtic Echo sent a super chat saying, I'm, I am a volunteer uh, at an animal charity in the UK. I'd like to encourage anyone in the world to join US Ark and aid their advocacy. Yes, please. Uh, Lyman Green sent a super chat saying, I hope FWC really does make changes as you suggest after, after this kind of incident. Yikes. Can't let it go. Uh, Locks and Bagel sent a super chat saying, you're too merciful. Those three guys need to receive what they gave. Mm, uh, I don't know about that. <laughs> how much do how, how much do we want to read this on that? <laughs> Maybe we don't. Yeah. Um, is there more to it than that? Uh, uh, no. That's... Please. I understand the sentiment. And, and the emotion that leads to comments like that, but that will do nothing but cause destruction. You know, that's, if that's the sort of justice you want, it's A, not gonna happen, and B, will only hurt us to, to call for it. Uh, Saki Noob sent a super chat saying, if only states would regulate cats and dogs the same way as other pets. I'm all for protecting native species. Cats and dogs are terrible for it. It, it would, you know, be interesting if uh, there was something that required states to regulate them all the same. So that if you were gonna come this way at one group of animals, you'd have to come this way at all of them. And that would be harder to justify. Um, interesting thought. Uh, Cats and Cardio sent a super chat saying, there is no more invasive species in the U.S. than cats. Uh, it is mind-blowing to me that just because they are, these are reptiles, they receive this kind of treatment. Mm -hmm. I love my namesake, but facts are facts. And I, I agree wholeheartedly, and I'm, I'm thankful that really for the first time I can remember the snakes in question here are being treated, at least by the media, almost as if they were cats. And, you know, I, I love cats. I don't, I don't like cats in the wild. Uh, well, unless they're where they're supposed to be. I don't like feral cats. I, I don't like your cat being a feral cat um, because I know how devastating, they, how devastating they are. But, you know, I, I love cats and, and I understand why people want to protect them. Um, Hopefully, Reptile can get a little of that charity as well. Uh, Zai Jix sent a super chat saying, do you think this issue could potentially impact the 2024 election? No, I really 100% don't think it could affect the 2020 election because the public doesn't care that much about it. This isn't, this isn't gonna be the issue that makes up their mind about you know, major, major elections. And that's another, and that's why it would be so stupid for us to try to utilize it as some sort of tool in a bigger political picture because it would do great damage to us actually being able to make a positive change here. And it would actually change no things uh, in the, in the uh, 2024 election. Iggyato sent a super chat saying, why move the conditional species to prohibited? I don't know. I think the conditional species was a very, very reasonable policy. Uh, still burdensome on reptile keepers, but I think necessarily burdensome. Um, they, you know, it's similar if you want to keep king cobras or you know really dangerous snakes and things like that down there. Um, crocodilians, you know, uh, it, it, it's reasonable to have some regulations like that. I wish people were more responsible across the board, but sometimes they're not, and so some regulation is required, and those seem like. Very reasonable regulations. I don't know, they found us. <laughs> nice. <laughs>
Uh, okay, uh, Professional Zombie 12. I think this is the second time we've seen this one. Yeah, thank you. Uh, if agreement was money, you'd be loaded right now. A lot of people were agreeing with you. Oh, well, thank time. you. <laughs> uh, I need to find a way to monetize agreement. <laughs> <laughs> Eric Han. I try to be reasonable. Hopefully that, hopefully that is contagious. Uh, Eric Han sent a super chat saying, don't make it political. Thank you. Thank you. That's one of the strongest messages I can send. Uh, Paraplanta Missionary sent a super chat saying, the FWC has too many resources already, Clint. Maybe it does. Maybe it does. Um, I, don't know, I don't know that an organization can have too many resources per se, but how they use them matters a great deal. And, uh, you, you know, as long as you can afford it. Uh, John Mayo sent a super chat saying, my question is, is the officers on scene getting any repercussions? Because I think the officer in charge should be fired and the other officers on the scene should have to go through retraining. Uh, I, I think, you know, they, the, the, the reality is they've definitely made mistakes. How many, how big and how egregious yet to be determined a little bit. Um, hopefully we don't let this fade away. And if there are, I mean, I think some consequences are definitely necessary and just how severe will depend on what the truth turns out to be on a few of these, uh, a few of these questions that are yet to be answered. Uh, Zeki sent a super chat saying, uh, this is not a political issue. This is about making sure this does not happen again. I never want to see this happen to my hog marines. Yes, please. Uh, T-shirts and top hats sent a super chat saying, I do want to address the misconception uh, of the conditional species permit. It didn't allow private individuals to have the species unless grandfathered in. I'll need to find out more information about that specifically as far as you know, we, like, uh, were you only allowed to have them before 2009? But I know a lot of people did. I, I, think, I think it is more that uh, the prohibited species, once the conditional species was changed, that that's when you couldn't have them unless you were grandfathered in, and you could only become grandfathered in if you were an exhibitioner. Um, but I, I'll, I'll, I'll try to run that um, by Phil Goss ag again, and make sure I understand that correctly as far as how you know how you were allowed because you were allowed to purchase snakes if you were a conditional species permit holder from other conditional uh, species permit holders at the time. So I'll need I'll need more details on that. Uh, you know this is this is going back a ways now. Uh, Fabio B sent a super chat saying wildlife way station in Southern California failed. So how can an individual keep large, dangerous animals who need space? Probably you need a lot of money. You know, if they're large, dangerous animals that need space, you need to be able to provide that space. But if you can provide what a zoo provides, I don't see why you shouldn't be allowed to. Uh, Laura G sent a super chat saying, we seem to have more and more troubling, trouble dealing with nuance. This situation needed to have the gray area utilized instead of making things, laws, black and white. Yes, and I'm, I'm grateful to have you say that. That's actually something that I heard from FWC today, is uh, we need more gray. Not everything is black and white, you know, and, and sometimes there are competing interests and, and sometimes there's nuance and, and uh, you know, a lot of facts. And I, I appreciate that they're a little bit on the same page as we are when it comes to the fact that, yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's not black and white. It's not, well, Python's bad uh, or, or Python's good. You know, it's Python's good in the right place. Python's bad in the wrong place. How do I keep them in the right place and keep them out of the wrong place? There's a lot of nuance to that. Jacob H. sent a super chat saying, after these last few years, I have precious little hope that the community will be able to table their political religions to come together in any true bipartisan way to approach this. Hopefully we can. Uh, Jacob Q. 
Huser uh, sent a super chat saying, I really appreciate your example of approaching the issue objectively, politely, and with opportunity for reconciliation, an effective approach to problem solving that is greatly underrated. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jacob. Jacob's someone I, I know personally. He's uh, been in the room many, many times and is a, is a very good person, and I, I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Did I pronounce his name? Huser? Uh, Saki Noob, Florida's mistake should be, should be a textbook example of how not to handle invasives. And like you said, they ignore lots of other invasives. Yep. I think we just, we can't let it fade away and be forgotten if it's going to be the te textbook example. Uh, Fabio B sent another super chat, uh, uh, two super chats, uh, without any text. Maybe it got lost in the, uh, the, the it, thing. It was the same question. It's the same question. Well, thank you, Fabio V. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Cats and Cardio sent a super chat saying, you should collab with Legal Eagle to discuss this. I'll, I'll have to look into that. That'd be cool. I'm uh, hoping it's the one from uh, Muppets. Say that again? <laughs> I'm hoping it's the one. Was it Sam the Eagle? That's who I hope it is. No, it's, 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 <laughs> I know it's a YouTube, YouTube channel. channel. <laughs> uh, Catherine Quinn sent a super chat saying, I heard Morph Market might make themselves more like Facebook in a sense. Do you think they'd be able to have like a leave the state bulletin board? Yeah, Morph Market is definitely something that is growing a lot and might be a great place to begin in a uh, like an emergency rehoming page that'd be a, an amazing feature and, and something that they could establish very quickly great suggestion elizabeth fortino sent a super chat saying thank you for this clint your approach is such a very important and delicate to the sorry your approach to such a very important and delicate subject is much appreciated I'm happy I got to see some typical Clint enthusiasm. It's a lovely sign. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I, hopefully, hopefully it spreads. Oz sent another super chat. Uh, he, uh, Oz says, this event has definitely taken an emotional toll. In addition to several other things going on, it's hard to keep positive and do the needful. Any advice when it comes to becoming, any advice at all becomes, emo, wait, hold on. Any advice when it, when it all becomes emotionally taxing. Sorry. Okay, so, so could, could I have just the beginning of that again? This event has definitely taken an emotional mm. toll. Yeah. In addition to other, to several other things going on, it's hard to keep positive and do the needful. It really, really is. I, I'll, I'll tell you just something, you know, a little piece of personal advice is um, obviously we, we don't want to forget about the big picture stuff that's going on and we don't you know we don't want to let it fade but also the smaller scale you look at the more power you have to do something about it to make it better you know uh, your own your own life your your household your family your community the bigger it gets the less power you have the smaller you look, the more power you have to change it. And oftentimes, even when the big picture looks really bad, if you've been working really hard on the smaller pictures, it looks pretty good up close. Uh, Rain sent a super chat saying, please, can you say super chat just one time? Super chat! We need that today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, at Koana, uh, sent a super chat saying, I'm in a unique position, my local representative and chief FWC officer. I live in a northern state, but I still want to say something to them. What's the best way to address it? I would say the, the best place to start a conversation would just be to see if they're aware of this situation. Um, and maybe if they're not, Help them to become aware and then see if you can continue a dialogue from there about, you know, how do we prevent something like this from happening here? Uh, Tanya Jones sent a super chat saying, Clint's Reptiles Rescue App. 
I'd like that. I, I, we'll need, we need resources. <laughs> uh, one true moo moo sent a super duper super chat. Super duper super chat. <laughs> uh, just want to say thank. Uh, just want to thank Clint for taking the time to address these issues with his YouTube audience and fellow reptile lovers. Uh, a special thanks to Intrepid Reptiles for joining this discussion and being active with his community. Big fan. Well, thank you very, very much. That that helps a lot, and I, I'm I'm just very grateful. Thank you. Uh, Joanna Aiden sent a super chat saying, "Thanks for talking about this." I have a hard time to understand why they didn't go back another day with a vet to euthanize the animals the right way. They can't have been in a hurry to put them down. That, yeah, that's one of the things I just don't understand. That, that's, my, that's my biggest outstanding question. Why were they euthanized April 6th? I, I don't, that's just not answered and I'm hoping that when the body cam footage comes out, I've heard a rumor that the body cam footage will answer it, but I will tell you that my source, well, w some of the facts provided uh, didn't add up when previous body cam footage came out. So hopefully, hopefully at least we have some answers. Uh, Clint, here's a question for me. Yeah. Is, is there a... Jason Chubb! <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> Don't make that a thing. <laughs> uh, we, we talked about the, the captive bull, um, plus pipping is a, a, a humane in a hurry. What is the... What, is, what would have been the, a better humane way? Or is that like... So, so I, I, I think, generally speaking... Plan A would have been chemical euthanization, uh, which would have involved, you know, injections that first uh, rendered the animal unconscious, and then a second one that would actually uh, be fatal. Um, that would probably, I, you know, I, I inquired. There's a good chance that the officers in the field are not qualified to administer chemical euthanasia, and so, you know, if they have to do it, captive bolt is the the best way. I mean, I mean, the reality is, if you as a keeper need to perform a, a euthanization, the recommended way is the full version of what they did. Now, they didn't do the full version; they did the half version, which is not a good way to do it at all. But, but uh, that the, you know, so so I don't know that that was an option if they had to do it right then, and if it had to be them. And they kind of say that it did, that he didn't want other people to show up and be involved. And I just, I don't know if that's accurate. You know, the stories, the stories of the two parties that were there, and this is all stuff that happened before the video, the stories do not agree. And so until we have the body cam footage, we will have no way of ironing out which, which story is accurate. Uh, Hearts Scales sent a super chat saying, thank you for speaking on this really devastating act uh, by the FWC and being an ambassador for reptile lovers everywhere. I encourage everyone to join US Ark Florida if haven't already, uh, even free helps. Absolutely. There are free memberships to US Ark Florida, so even if you don't have money, numbers matter. Uh, Indigo Eclipse sent a super chat saying, how much do I donate to have Clint do a Are Cotton Mouse the Best pest, Pet Snake episode? And what is Clint's favorite viper? Well, well let's see, Cotton Mouse. All, all you'd have to do is uh, fund us being able to send at least three people to wherever I can find somebody with a cotton mouth. Um, and uh, yeah, I would I would enjoy that. My favorite viper. Which viper is the best? Um, so historically, it's always been the gaboon viper. But I, there's just a heck of a lot of really rad vipers. I think I think right now, if I was gonna see, you know, like I've seen lots of gaboon vipers and I love them. 
But if I see one now, like I'm, it's not, it's not going to be the most exciting viper I could possibly see. I think, I think right now the viper I would be personally the most excited to see in person would be a spider-tailed viper. I haven't seen one yet, ever. I just recently found out that there are some in, in captive collections. And so uh, a spider-tailed viper would be pretty darn ex exciting, at least. It might not be my favorite viper, but... And, and I have on our set two amazing model vipers. One of them is a gaboon viper and the other is a spider-tailed viper. But if I was going to get a viper, it wouldn't be either of those. And what it would be will be coming out pretty soon. That's right. <laughs> Uh, Saki Noob sent a super chat saying, still waiting for you to review toe biters. Oh, I would like that. The Bellish Nomadid bugs. They're an aquatic bug that I've got some in my, in my pin box. But uh, yes, I would like that very much. In fact, I know a place that has one and we're, we're working on uh, starting to do videos with them. Sean Russell sent a super chat saying, Clint, you talked me into getting a pet jumping spider. That's a great choice. Uh, on off, Joheen sent a super chat saying, thanks for not being political about this. If I were to get a snake, are there any that are good to permanently house in a 20 gallon enclosure? Yeah. There are a lot of them that would be great in a 20-gallon enclosure. Things like a uh, sand boa, uh, uh, a uh, hognose snakes, um, you know, uh, probably a, uh, African house snakes. There's, there's quite a few of them that would do great in a 20-gallon as long as it has a really good lid. That's going to be one of the keys. Uh, Jeff sent a super chat saying, this community is so is lucky to have someone like you when events like this occur. It's good to have an informed, measured, and appropriate response and direction. Hello from Australia, longtime viewer. Well, thank you very much. I, uh, I, I know this isn't necessarily the kind of approach that maybe is the most attractive on a, a platform like YouTube, but I think it's the most appropriate approach. And so uh, I, I'm, I'm thankful that there are people like you that, that uh, value it as well. <coughs> uh, Lydia, or sorry, uh, Nathaniel Sanks sent a super chat. Thank you. Thank you, Nathaniel. Uh, Lydia Batters, Battersby sent a super chat uh, saying, I'm so glad I live in the UK. The laws in the US and the people enforcing them are ridiculous. So sad. They can be. You know, one of the, one of the strengths and weaknesses uh, of the United States is that, you know, the individual states have a lot of individual power, which is kind of great um, because if, you know, say, say you live in a state that has terrible laws, well, you can go to a different one potentially and not have to deal with them without having to leave the country. But it also means that at any given time, probably at least one of the 50 states has some real bad laws. Uh, so CM, Ace, CMAC, D. Hong, I probably butchered that, okay. sent a super duper super chat. Super duper super chat! <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez. Okay. <laughs> uh, saying, uh, I hate Clint. Uh, no, 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 no. I hate seeing Clint so bummed out. I hope uh, my donation helps. Well, it, it put a smile on my face because uh, it put a smile on Jason's face when I, when I made him giggle. So <laughs> it, it worked to, to perfection. And yeah, I mean, the reality is I, I don't like to be bummed out either. Uh, I, I like to be happy. I usually have a pretty positive outlook on the world. But there are moments when it's okay to not feel perfectly happy. Uh, Resin Scarpaw sent a super chat saying, thank you, Clint. You explain things in a manner that even a layman can understand. Uh, this destruction of life is a tragedy and I hope that some good comes from it. Also, you're adorable. Well, thank you very much. 
I told you, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> that, that one person. Yeah. <laughs> to start. Uh, <laughs> <it's a> start. <laughs> okay. Uh, one true moo moo sent another super chat. This thank you, this one is true moo moo. Super duper super chat. Super duper super chat. <laughs> I also want to thank Garrett Hartle of Reach Out Reptiles oh, yes. for speaking out publicly about the situation. I don't know if Garrett is the one reading the text, but it certainly sounds like him. Thank you, uh, uh, thank all of you. I, uh, is, is, are you the figure? Garrett? I, I am not Garrett. Okay, so, so uh, yes, Garrett Hartle, uh, just so you know, is, he, he is the owner of Reach Out Reptiles, who uh, breeds super dwarf reticulated pythons, amazing ones, that's where Athena, my super dwarf came from earlier. He is also, He's sacrificing time that he could be investing in his own YouTube channel to voluntarily run the US ARC YouTube channel. And if you're not already a subscriber to the US ARC YouTube channel, please jump over there and subscribe as well because the numbers on that matter, right? It, it shows people, hey, this is, this is not just a few people, this is a lot of people, and, and all of a sudden they need to be taken seriously. So if you can, Hop over there and, and support Garrett Hartle and US Arc by, by subscribing to their, their YouTube channel. That's another free thing you can do to make a big difference. Uh, Sean Rousel sends a super chat saying, Gaboons are the chubby, uh, the, are the cute chubby kids of venomous snakes. There's a lot of truth to that. Uh, Nathaniel Sanks sent a super chat saying, uh, This is my boyfriend's account. My name is Abby. Thank you. Abby. Abby. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your kind heart. I live in Florida, and this has been so awful. Thank you for spreading awareness. Thank you for loving creepy crawlies. Uh, my black widow says hi. She's also one widow. of a few who think you're adorable, apparently. Is that very few? Very, <laughs> Maybe very like few. three or four. <laughs> <laughs> That's more than you two. <laughs> I don't see it. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, maybe in person it's just <laughs> some flaws that are hidden by yeah. <laughs> There's a filter on Yeah, there. yeah, yeah. It's all an Instagram filter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> the Mr. Rogers filter. <laughs> yeah. yeah. People come to the room all the time and they walk through the door and they're like, Yeah, I mean, hello. <laughs> it's common. Uh, okay, we gotta we gotta go quick. Uh, Ray was here, sent a super chat saying keepers should invite people to interact with their pets. Good interactions change minds. Absolutely. Uh, uh, Paraplaneta missionary. I think this is the third time we've seen a super chat from them. Uh, says a really Latin word that I don't know. Uh, Leo Zella. Cellophallus carinatus? Leo, Leo Cellophallus carinatus? I don't know. Do you want to Google it? Yes. Give me a I common do. name and all. Leo Cellophallus. Uh, Northern curly tailed lizard. Okay, lizard. yes. Uh, They're all over the place in southern Florida. Needs a review video, Clint. Absolutely. Uh, Cat12 Carmen sent a super chat saying, could we get a hermit crab video? I'd like that. I'd like that a lot. I, uh... Yes. Uh, Rebecca, Rebecca Locklear sent a super chat saying, African crested porcupine video. Hmm. I actually have been strongly considering a porcupine video lately. I, I almost had one crawl up my leg when we were in the Amazon, and then that same species, I just was up by one the other day, and it was a delightful little spike ball, and yes, I do like me a porcupine. Uh, fatty, the African crested, those are your really serious porcupines. Uh, fatty Pancake sent a super chat saying, what is the optimal outcome of this horrible situation? Do you think this will impact how the FWC will operate going forward, or do you think they will ignore this so it dies down and gets forgotten? They're not ignoring it. But um, the quicker we forget it, the quicker they will forget to make changes. They're planning to make changes, but you know, if, if, the, if, if the pressure dies down, so will the incentive to make them. So don't stop. Be polite, but don't stop. Uh, Ethan Kaufman sent a super chat saying, 
So are you implying with the cotton mouth thing that if I physically bring you my pet bready python, you would review it? I say this half jokingly. Um, we do that sort of thing sometimes. So possibly, please schedule in advance. <laughs> yeah, don't. <laughs> uh, Thorn Custo Custos sent a super chat saying, I'm curious, what's it like living um, in your current state, how are the laws and cost of living? Oh. <laughs> Utah is really quite wonderful. And I, when I first moved here, I, it, I, I really struggled with it. But I, you know, increasingly over time, I have enjoyed Utah more. I found their winters not to be nearly as egregious as, as Colorado. It's getting to be more expensive to live here, but still cheaper than a lot of states. And the laws about reptile keeping are getting better and better. And, uh, you know, because the right sorts of people are working with the government agencies to make sure that everybody wins. You know, we, we, draft, we draft policy and legislation that benefits everyone. And uh, that's great. Utah's, Utah's terrific. And man, there's a lot of stuff to do outdoors if you're into that kind of thing. If you're into that kind of thing. Nice. Uh, let's see. I lost, I lost my place. Am I this one? Yeah. Uh, uh, King Lorshi sent a super chat saying, you're truly an inspiration. I remember, I remember a grumpy commenter uh, called you a loser, to which you responded, I am the loser I want to be. <laughs> <laughs> I love your enthusiasm, and I hope the best for the hobby. Stay rad. Well, thank you so much, Your Majesty. <laughs> Good. Uh, Fabio B sent another uh, super chat saying, Do you know Enoch Wildlife Rescue? He does great work and could use the support. Well, I appreciate you giving him a little shout out. I'll, I'll have to look into it. Enoch Wildlife Rescue? Yep. Uh, that other main protagonist sent a super chat saying, Have you ever considered a Viper Boa review? Others yeah. need to know how rad they are. That is it. Fact. Fact. Yes. <laughs> uh, I think. We did it? I think we caught up. Wow, we that we good. Well, hey. Um, I mean, people, of course, do know how to stop us now. But <laughs> thank you guys for sticking with us all, all the way to the end here. I, I know this has been long. I hope it's been valuable. Um, you know, if you have more questions, please keep submitting them. Comment them in the comments. I know more information will be available soon. We will make as much of that available to you as quickly as we can. There probably will be a follow-up to this live stream in the relatively near future, I would imagine. And so um, it's not over. You know, it's not over. And, and, and you know, if for, the, let, me, let me just say this. There will definitely be another live stream on this topic because... We can't let this be forgotten. Even if my live stream is just to give you an update of, hey, FWC made all these amazing changes and we can, we can back off now because it worked. That would be great. I'd love that. But we're not going to stop talking about this on this channel. Um, and, and please share anyone who is keeping us talking about this in a way that is actually productive and, and might lead to good outcomes. We got one more super chat, of course. <laughs> they know how not to let us go. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Uh, the, the, the real Holtzinator sent a super chat saying, uh, Hi, Clint. I've been watching your channel for years now. Thank you for all the fun. I do not keep any reptiles as I have two wonderful indoor cats. Mm. Uh, thank you for your pragmatic level-headedness. Well, thank you so much, the real Holtzinator. Um, that, that means a lot, and I, I appreciate your responsible choices. Uh, of course, you know, if you ever are in a situation where you could have a room not accessible to your cats, a world of joy awaits you. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here. As always, like and subscribe. Be a positive influence on the world and, and a, a, a positive representative of the reptile community at this essential time. And we hope to see you real soon. I have no idea how to end the stream, so.
We might be here for a while. Oh, there it is. Maybe. Try again. Just All right. Thank you, guys. <laughs>